Hello, welcome to episode 7 of our Thought for the Day podcast. My name is Pastor John and I will be joined by Pastor Tim. Today we will discuss Revelation chapter 11, the two witnesses. So we have, uh, we have a lady that had reached out to, to Janie um, you know, in the past. She talked to her again today. Her name's Julie. Uh, and she might be watching, but uh, Julie, if you are, we're going to pray for you. And she's uh, she was born with what's called a horseshoe kidney. And if you don't know what a horseshoe kidney is, it's when your kidneys are are attached together. And and so that creates um, significant issues. She's in her mid fifties, and um, and now is severely anemic, and they're going to start dialysis. So she's, you know, she's in need of prayer so that uh, she can heal. So we'll hold her up in prayer. Um, as we open up today. So if everyone can bow with us, we'll, uh, we'll start our, our study this evening with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity that we have, even with the difficulties, to share your word. We know that whenever we're doing something that's worthwhile, that's beneficial, that's edifying for the body of Christ, that uh, the devil wants to stop that. And so we just praise you, Lord, that that wasn't successful this evening. And we just ask for your blessing upon this study and uh, that uh, everything that we say is true. Anything that we say that isn't true, Lord, we just we just pray that it, it falls from the memories of our listeners as quickly as it enters into their ears, and that those things that we say that are true, that that are what you want them to hear, that they hold that into the in, into their hearts. Uh, we hold up before you uh, all those that are crying out to you in faith and in prayer with their needs, Lord. But specifically, we hold up uh, Julie before you and her. Um, her time of uh, being anemic and, and having to start dialysis and the health issues that go along with her horseshoe uh, kidney situation. We just we put her in your hands, Lord. We know uh, that you've given us the resources, the medical and the, uh, and the doctor resources that are needed to treat people, but ultimately you're the ultimate physician, Lord. And so we just pray that you're with her and that you bring her back to her full health. Um, this is just one that we hold up before you. There's so many others, Lord. We don't know all their names and their needs, but we know that you do. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right. Good prayer. That's a good idea, Pastor Tim. I think just like at our Bible studies and just like at church. Yeah. Uh, yeah, please. She says, Miss Sonia says, keep repeating words like uh, stuttering. <laughs> um, I think this prayer thing is a great idea because the power of prayer, as we know from Daniel 10, is very powerful to pray out loud. That's right. And uh, Deborah from from church, uh, the, the Lord's Heritage Church says, pray until something happens. And uh, yes. I like that. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So we're going to, you know, we're continuing kind of our deep dive into to several of the different concepts that we find in the book of Revelation. And so tonight we're talking about the two witnesses in Revelation 11. And um, as we get started, John, I think it'd be a good idea to just kind of read through what we're going to be talking about. So uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to read through the first few okay. verses of Revelation chapter 11. So okay. uh, if start. everybody's following along, uh, I would encourage you to do so. If you've got your Bibles, open them up. If not, it's going to be on the screen. Uh, and so now it is on the screen. And um, it says, and there were given me, and this is John talking, of course, in his, in the revelation that he was given. It says, and there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the length, uh, measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months, which is why I read the first two verses, right? Forty and two months happens to be three and a half years. Then in verse 3, it says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. And those days add up to the same amount, three and a half years. And then it tells us who they are, right? These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And this was the prophecy back from uh, Zechariah that we'll get into in detail. Yes. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before God, the God of earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. Keep these things in mind and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven and the rain and, uh, and it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have. And so the days of their prophecy, right? 1260 days. And it says, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. And when they shall f finish their testimony, 
The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also the Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days, that's, that's familiar, and a half, mm -hmm. and shall suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell on the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. They're going to be really happy that these witnesses are killed. Because there's a these, lot here. You're right, there's a lot here. Because these two oh, yeah. prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth by prophesying, right? And then after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet. They were resurrected and the great fear fell upon uh, them which saw them. So, um, so that's what we're going to be talking about, right, is kind of the details of what's in there. And, and um, you know, I think the main uh, thrust of our conversation is going to be trying to figure out if we know who these are, right? But I think just like trying to figure out who the writer of the book of Hebrews was, we, we, don't, we don't know, right? Now there's evidence, and we're going to go through that evidence, but we don't know without a shadow of a doubt who, these, who the identity of these two witnesses are. But we I know. Say I, say it's, I say it's, Pastor Tim, I say it's very, uh, we don't actually know, like you said, but it's right. very safe to say with, when we're done, I think all the scriptures that right. point to what we're about to go into make a very clear story. It does. It, it, uh, I, I would say that with, with almost little doubt, we know at least who three of the people who two of them could be, <laughs> right? And there's, sure, a, yes. there's very strong evidence to two of those three, but there's evidence for all three. And we'll go through those. And so um, what we just read, right? Well, what do we know about these, these two witnesses, right? So first they're going to be clothed in sackcloth and they prophesy for 1260 days for three and a half years. We know for a fact that they represent the two olive trees that Zechariah prophesied, right? Um, we know that they become before the first and the second woe in Revelation. So when we start talking about those judgments, we know that that's where they come. And then we know that they, that they perform miracles, which is one of the hints, right, that we'll get into, right? They, they use fire to consume those that, that come out against them, and they turn water into blood. Those are very specific prophecies that are, that are evidence, right? And then uh, after they prophesy for three and a half years, they're killed by the beast, and then in three and a half days, they're resurrected, and, and then they ascend into heaven, which is another one of the things that we'll use to, mm -hmm. um, as evidences. So, now we're going to kind of dig into the specifics, right, John? And, and as we do that, I right. think it's good to orient people to the time frame that we're talking about. And, and I know, like you, I like um, uh, Breiker, right? He's a, a teacher that has a YouTube channel, a very yeah. popular. And, um, and he likes to draw this timeline before any, all of his teachings, right? And I think it's very useful for us to see uh, where that is. So I'm going to put that up from your notes um, if you want to talk okay. us through it. Uh, do you want me to just do a brief introduction of how we got here, just very brief, or no, as far as Revelation yeah. in the beginning, or do we need to do that in the show? Sure, you can, if you want to. Okay, and, and a real quick nutshell, we've done several shows now, I guess close to 10 shows, uh, and we started with the book of Revelation, and the Revelation, uh, it starts out in Revelation chapter 1, there's a revelation that, that God gives to his son, he gives to Jesus, about Jesus, uh, things with much which must shortly come to pass. He gives that revelation through an angel to the apostle John in Revelation 1, if I said that clearly. And then so chapter 2 and chapter 3, after we get that revelation, uh, there are seven letters that are written to the seven churches from Apostle John on the island of Patmos when he was in, um, in prison, correct, Pastor Tim? That's correct. Okay, and so chapter 2 and 3 alludes to that. And then you get to Revelation chapter 4, and you have what's called the harpazu, or the catching away, the rapture where the church has lifted. You don't hear the, the word church anymore after Revelation chapter four, verse one. And so you have the throne room of God and it's explained in great detail. And then you have these judgments, be, you know, then you have the elders and these judgments are being handed out. There's these seven scrolls that are open, the first of three sets of seven judgments. And we went into those first set of judgments, which were the four horsemen. We talked about that a few episodes ago. Um, and then um, we went into the, what's called the 144,000, which I think was nearing <laughs> my mom's <says> mothership. <laughs> mothership. I like that. <laughs> what was that? I heard something. Um, and so uh, the 144,000 had their heads sealed and they were protected from some sort of judgment. 
And so I think in a nutshell, that's a good entry kind of leading us up to these two witnesses that are present during this time period of the 144,000 Jews that were sealed. Did I explain that well, Pastor Tim? So I far? think you did. You did a good job. And so um, Pastor Tim had read over uh, Revelation, basically chapter 11, verses 3 through 12, basically. And you have all these things that are written down that give us uh, shadows or pictures and lots of details about who these witnesses are that, that have been appointed to carry out this, this, this mass revival during this tribulational period, which is the last three and a half years. Would you agree? I would agree. Okay. And there's going to be this tribulational period as we believe for pre-trib rapture believers. Um, there's going to be this mass revival. Um, and you're going to have these two, um, you're going to have these two witnesses that are going to kind of lead this, um, this, um, revival. And so I think the first thing, Pastor Tim, now that we've read the oversight of these chat, uh, these verses that talk about it, what I think we could do is start with these things, these clues, like starting with this candlestick and the two olive trees, because it says they'll prophesy, um, 1,203 score days clothed in sackcloth. And it says, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. And I think that's a good pause. Would you agree? I would agree. So, Pastor Tim, who might these two olive, first off, and there's lots of clues, but these two olive trees and these two candlesticks, could you take us somewhere that might point to who that could be? Yeah, you know, um, I'm, <clears throat> you're not going to believe this. <laughs> now I'm hearing the, the echo in my oh, head. Oh, you're hearing it too? <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, great. I don't know why that is, but, um, but uh, I think you're asking me who might be uh, the candlesticks, right? Who are these two witnesses? And so... I think there's there's uh, there's there's three people that could be identified as the two witnesses, right? And there's Moses, Elijah, and Enoch. And then there's also another theory that um, is held by some, but not the not the majority theory for sure, and that it'll be two unknown people, right? That that may might not have existed in in the Old Testament days, but that you know become prominent in the in the end times, but. But I think that the, uh, most scholars agree that it's either Moses, Elijah, or Enoch, two of those three. And there's evidences for those. So hopefully that was I, I an answer to the question you asked. Well, I, so I personally, this is me personally, um, you know, the, 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 whole, the whole, you know, can't be dogmatic. But um, I could almost say this, this is, could almost be dogmatic for me based on all the clues that are so literal over and over. And we're going to talk about that. Okay. Um, do you know, Pastor Tim, can you still hear me? Is the audio still overlapping? I can hear you. I'm going to try to fix this. I, I you know, as you're talking, so go ahead. But okay, did you so, want to go through that breaker uh, 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 image or no? I will. Yeah. I'll, I'll just kind of, I'll kind of, first I'd like to outline this two candlesticks, the first part of these scriptures, it's two olive trees and two candlesticks. I want to start there and I want to kind of lead people to scripture. Can okay. you pull them up for me for the on screen? I can, yeah. Let me uh, let me move okay. you over with the scripture. Now, um, I want to sh- we're we're going to mention the three people it could be, and the two of which I believe it one you know ninety nine percent would have to be based on all these scriptures. But I will mention the third person that some people believe it could be as well. Okay. And and uh, and I'll show you why I personally believe it could not be. But, you tell me where to go, and I'll, I'll bring it up. Okay, we're going to go to Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. We're going to start with Zechariah chapter 4, 1 through 3, and then we're going to go to Zechariah 4, 11 through 14. Okay. So Zechariah 4, um, 1 through 3. I'm going to pull it up myself. And you guys, I'm telling you, listen closely to this. This is going to be good. Um, so what we're doing, we're breaking down the first part of those scriptures that say the two candlesticks and the two um, the two candlesticks and the two olive trees. Who are they? So Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. I'm trying to get there quickly. Uh, Zechariah chapter 4. These are just to have a regular Bible in front of me. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and tell me when you get them up because I'm not looking at your screen. I have Zechariah 4, 1 up. So the, the, the viewers can see that? I can't, so I'm going to go by that. That's right. Okay, so I'm actually just going to use my Bible because that's the best thing to use. Okay. So Zechariah 4, verse 1 says, And the angel talked with me, excuse me, and the angel that talked with me came again and waked me 
as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. I'm going to go all the way down. Actually, I'm just going to read from here. And said unto me, what seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold, a candlestick, all of gold. It's interesting. With a bowl upon the top of it and a seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof and two olive trees by it. There's olive trees now. One upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. Now, one day we can talk about the seven branch candlestick in great detail. I'd love to do a show about that, Pastor Tim. Yeah. Uh, that'd be a show in itself. Now, can we jump over really quickly to Zechariah chapter 4, verses 11 through 14? Yeah. Now, right now, while Pastor Tim is doing that, all I'm trying to point you guys to are those uh, in the first part of Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. You hear about the two olive trees. It says that they're clothed in sackcloth. These two are the olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of earth. And now we're going to Zechariah to show you things that I believe reference those two, those two statements. Let me know when you have Zechariah. I can't see, so when you have it up. Do we have it up right there? Okay, yeah, Zechariah chapter 4, verses 11 through 14. Are we ready? Yep, we're ready. Then it says, Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones. That's interesting. Interesting yeah, verbiage. Very clear, uh, very clear connection. And it, and it, uh, it solidifies <laughs> that by saying in Revelation, that's who they're talking about, right? Yeah, and it does. And you know what? There's going to be people out there that say, well, I'm not convinced. And, and I'm, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you said you're not convinced. And so at the end of that, it says that stand by the Lord and the whole earth. Now, if we go back to the original scriptures in Revelation chapter 11, 3 through 12, the first part that you read, Pastor Tim, let me know when you get that up. I'm there. We're going to go to the next, next it's section. There. It's there. So we have, again, Revelation 11, to, just so you guys out there that are watching know, 3 through 11 is what we're referencing back and forth. So I can't tell what verses, but after the two candlesticks standing before the God of earth, it says, and if any man will hurt them, this is very interesting. This is a revelation. If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and, de and devour their enemies. Pastor Tim, what would that look like? Can you imagine? Yeah, <laughs> I try not to imagine those things, John. <laughs> yeah, I mean, wow. Um, and it says, if any man will hurt them, this is during the tribulation period. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. And here's the key verse right here. These have power to shut up heaven. I want to stop right there. These have power to shut up. So these two men have power to shut up heaven. Is there anywhere yep. in the Bible that two men that, that follow the, the, the first um, images we found, they both have power to shut up heaven. So these have power to shut up heaven. Well, it turns yeah. out, Pastor Tim, there is a reference to that. That's right. I think it's somewhere in First Kings or thereabouts. That's right. First Kings chapter 17, verse 1 is interesting. We see this part in the Bible where you see two men that have the same ability, but they have different abilities. And I think we're going to, this is going to pull out some more truth. All right. I've, uh, I've got that uh, scripture up. You have it up? I'm not I looking need... at it. So First Kings chapter 17, you guys follow along. This is amazing. And it says, Elijah. Now, you guys might sometimes see Elias or Elias, um, and that's an Old Testament word for Elijah. Elijah. That's an yep. old name for Elijah. Okay? So Elias or Elias and Elijah are the same. Now, on a side note, if anybody remembers reading about John the Baptist when he came in the book of John, it says, um, I come, he says, when John the Baptist showed up on the scene to introduce Jesus, he says, I come in the spirit of Elias or Elias. I'm one wandering. I don't have this verbatim. Wandering in the wilderness, paving the way. He, uh, I come before him, but he has preferred before me. You guys will probably remember that. John the Baptist, and I don't have the scripture reference. That was just Holy Spirit brought that to my, my remembrance, Pastor Tim. Yeah. If, if you want to pull that up really quick, you can. I knew but, I threw that on you. <laughs> you did. Let's see. Uh, That's okay. You can handle it. I think it's John chapter, right around chapter one, right? Let's see. Um, is it, I don't remember off the top of my head. Let's do a search for Elias, because 
And that's okay. While you're looking for that scripture, I want I want to make something make a point. Uh, or you guys can both look for it. Here's the point I'm making while Pastor Tim's looking for it. You hear back in the Old Testament, John the uh, so John the uh, the Baptist was we know I believe Scripture says he was six months older than Jesus. Is that correct? Yep. Because, yeah, that's true. So there was prop. So basically, there was prophecy. There was there was John was saying, "Look, Jesus is coming," in the spirit of Elijah or Elias. It says. Yep. Here it is. Uh, so, I'll, I'll put it up, John, while you're talking. So this is so important. Really, I was going to talk about this at the end, but this is phenomenal. So the Jews heard about, they heard from this, this John the Baptist that, look, I'm first, I got here first, but there's someone coming who's before, uh, I'm not even worthy to loose his, to la- unlatch his shoe. He's preferred before me. And it says he leaped in his mother's womb, right? Well, he's saying that, look, I come in the spirit of Elijah. So Elijah was coming in body, according to this, uh, as somehow verbally out of John the Baptist's mouth talking about the good news, and the people rejected what John the Baptist was saying. I hope I said that right. And so had they have listened at that time, we wouldn't have had to need, uh, we wouldn't even have had a need for the church age, and the Gentiles wouldn't even have made it in. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting to think about that, right? Because it's true. Jesus came to usher in the kingdom, but knowing that they were going to reject him. Right. So it's not as if something happened that he didn't know, but it's he had true. a plan already. He, yeah, that's right. He came to usher in the kingdom and had they not rejected him, the kingdom of, you know, the kingdom of God would have come. Yeah. Matter of fact, we wouldn't even have had the tribulational period. I mean, and, and, and that brings me to the Mount of Olives later. I'll talk about the Olive yeah. discourse, but, but the, the Gentiles, the only reason that we are, which is the Gentiles or anybody that's not from the, the 12 Jewish tribes. So that's all the rest of us. Right. We Everyone would else. not even have had, we're spiritually grafted in, the Bible says, but the, the original branch, which were the Jews, the natural branch, the Bible says, and I'm throwing this at Pastor Tim without warning too, it was supposed to be grafted back in because when they disbelieved, when Elijah showed up through John the Baptist, God said he would graft back in that branch, but first he kind of puts them on hold and he's given us Gentiles because of that, a chance to come That's to right. the faith as a spiritual grafted in branch, if that makes sense. It does, and so, probably the King James doesn't use the word jealous. I was looking for the scripture that says that he called upon the Gentiles to make the Jews jealous, right? That's the Oh, well, that's good, yeah. That was the reason that um, after they rejected him, right, that he called the Gentiles. That's right, exactly right. And, you know, I wasn't planning on saying that, but the Holy Spirit led me to put that in there for a reason because it's going to it'll tie up right at the end why I said that. We were reading Zechariah chapter 4, verses 11 through 14, and we read about these two witnesses also from Revelation 11 said they'd have the power to shut up heaven, yep, uh, which to stop it from raining, and call down fire. That's right. So when I when I read that, Pastor uh, Tim, it says uh, I'm jumping around and forgive me. Zechariah 4 11 through 14 towards the end says, "Knowest thou not what these be?" I think that's around verse 14. And I said, "No, Lord." Then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Anointed, that means to rub off. So there's two anointed ones. And that's interesting. And so we had mentioned, I think, 1 Kings chapter 17. Pastor Tim, is that right? That's right. I feel bad you're on the other end trying to find scriptures. I got it. It's up. But it's awesome. You guys stay here, I'm telling you. Uh, If I may. 1 Kings 17, 1 is up. Talking about Elijah. Yeah. And so do you want to ad lib or do you want me to go on for a minute? Yeah, yeah I, I thought you were going to bring up the two that had the that had the power to shut up heaven, right? So, Correct. Yep. And so we, we talked about this. So there's two that had the power to shut up heaven. And so we're going to take you guys. This is awesome. If you're not convinced who these people are, and we're going to talk about it, we're going to go to James chapter 5, verses 17, and then verse 18. Okay. And I'll wait for you to pull that up. Just remember that side note about where Elijah first showed up in the Old Testament. And then when we get to the end, that'll make sense here in a little while. Yep. This is, uh, let's go, let's go back uh, real quick though, uh, because I think it, um, first King 17, uh, let's read yes. that right as a, as a lead into it. Cause it says Elijah, the Tishbite, um, says, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook of Cherith, 
that is before Jordan. And then um, if we read on in there, uh, it, it talks about not raining for three and a half years. I did, so, I'm glad you said that. I completely yeah. skipped it. Yep. So that that's a good lead into to what we're going to be talking about in James, right? So yes. so now I'll bring up James again, and uh, we're James five, right? Yeah, yeah. James five seventeen and eighteen. I'm glad Pastor Tim said that because that's key. That three and a half year period with no rains key here. Yep. And again, we're breaking down the second segment of those first set of verses to say who these witnesses are, just in case you guys are that's joining right. just now. Um, and whenever you get it up, on your end, I can yeah. read it. Um, it's like. almost up instantly, John. So you can just go ahead and okay. start. Cool. So Elias, as you know, is Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. So just like us. He might have been a prophet, but he was like us. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Three and a half years. And so that's tied back to the, that's the thing that's tied back to the first Kings. Didn't mean to interrupt your thought process there, John. No, but that, no, that's it. You're right. Right. That ties back to the first Kings passage, which said, you know, what she said to Ahab and then it didn't rain. Yeah. And you had to say that because those things tie together to get to the conclusion that we want to talk about. That's right. So we had kind of had to give you the nuggets to tie this together. So verse 18 says he prayed again. This is James five, verse 18. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit and so uh that's interesting because now you have somebody elijah had the power to do what pastor tim to shut up the heavens shut up the heavens stop the rain stop so that's rain. interesting because revelation where we started right there in the first uh, few verses it says that these two that they were mentioning have power to shut up heaven that it rained not in the days of their prophecy. Now, that's crazy. That's a direct parallel. That's right. But you might say, well, I'm not convinced. And and I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'll go down to, uh, let's go down to Exodus chapter 4, verse 9, Pastor Tim. So somebody shut up the rain. These two uh, witnesses said they'd have the power to shut up the heavens or stop the rain. And here we just read in James, that's exactly what happened. Elijah did it. Right. And what's the, what's the next thing that it says they have the power to do? And, and the earth and brought forth her fruit. Right. Uh, with the two witnesses, right? The first thing is they can shut up the heavens. And the second and thing is that they turn water. Fire down. And, right. And the second, oh, water. Yeah, to water to blood. Right. So I got Exodus 4 and 9 up. That's right. Yeah, thank you. It said they'd have the power to, to turn the water to blood. Now, you guys who've been in the Bible any time, I know the first thing you're thinking about, a man named Moses. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so Exodus chapter 4, verse 9. Now, this is when the Israelites were being, uh, you know, freed from captivity. This is a, the exiting. This is when they were freed from bondage. That's the whole book. That's what it's about. And it says, Exodus 4, chap, uh, verse, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 9. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken or listen unto their voice, that thou shalt take of the water and of the river and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. And Pastor Tim, as we know, there were some plagues and stuff that happened. That's right. Um, now, that sounds a lot like somebody they just mentioned, one of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. It does. And so that's probably a coincidence, right? <laughs> there are no coincidences, Pastor John. Yeah. So, um, so you might still say, well, I'm, that's... Okay, that lines up. And so what if we go back to Revelation chapter 11 and keep reading now? I don't know if I've confirmed the part I want to talk about. Uh, we mentioned, did we mention the fire proceeding out of their mouth? We, uh, we, we, yes. we didn't mention that one, right? So how does the fire um, tie back to Elijah, right? So. Okay, yeah, I'm so trying to go back about, and forth with it. That's right. We talked about Elijah uh, and, you know, the, the two witnesses have, have these powers to perform miracles, right? One of them, sorry to repeat myself, um, to repeat oh, ourselves, well. right? One of them is to shut up the heavens, right? Another right. one is to turn water into blood. And so we've shown that there's prophets of the past, right? Moses and Elijah that have the same, that did the same things, right? Now there's another one that's fire from heaven, right? And that's connected to, uh, to Elijah as well. 
and this is in um, this is in I think it's in um, Malachi or Malachi, right? If we say chapter it in the four, Hebrew. Yeah. and yeah, uh, Malachi four. So let me bring that up. Would you like to read that section and talk about this fire from heaven? Pastor yeah, Dave? let me uh, let me do that. Okay. All right. So this is uh, Malachi chapter four, and uh, and we're lo- we're looking at uh, verses four and five. Right. It says, "Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all of Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great day." This is not the scripture that I was looking for. I was looking for the one where it took him up. Uh, into heaven, right? Let's see. Oh, oh, that's uh, where he gets where he goes up and says he didn't die. So I don't I don't have that one written down, but that's a good idea to mention that. Yeah. And so, so that we know. The... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, we know. While you're looking for that, we do know. Anybody that's read the Bible anytime, you know that Elijah uh, never died and he was taken up to heaven. Um, similar to Moses, we know Moses died, but his body was uh, taken to heaven, and the archangel Michael and Satan debated over it. Yeah. So you had this. Did I say that right? He's taken up to heaven, and, and for some reason, maybe to use it at a later date, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll get to that, right? So uh, I just wanted to tie this one. Um, it's Second Kings okay. two, and uh, okay. And this is I wanted to tie this to the uh, fire piece, right? So. Okay. Uh, gotcha. Gotcha. Right. So if we look at Second Kings two in. Um, and I put you up there, so let me put me up there since I'm reading it. Uh, if we look at Second Kings 2, it says, And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, then, then Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And that whirlwind, we don't see it clearly here, but that whirlwind is, is a, a whirlwind of fire. right? So Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind of fire. And uh, that ties to this uh, fire from heaven with the two witnesses in Revelation. I didn't even write that down. That's I'm so glad you put that in there, Pastor Tim. Yeah. Teamwork. Thanks. Teamwork. Awesome. Yeah. So we know he was taken up. That's important to know that. And I got ahead and forgive me for that. Um, okay. So, so I think we left off um, where we were, um, we were turning into to that Malachi chapter, right? That um, yeah. talks about Elijah's return during Armageddon. And so, yeah, we're reading scriptures and we're starting, we're, we're, we're in Malachi 4, and all these scriptures we're, we're reading are referencing Revelation chapter 11, 3 through 12, where these two witnesses are mentioned, which we're breaking down a segment at a time and cross-referencing. So yep. now we're at Malachi cross-referencing, um, they have the power to turn water to blood, uh, proceedeth out of their mouth as fire. Is that what we're confirming right now? Yeah, that, so, um, so I have Malachi 4 uh, and 5 up. If you okay. that portion where uh, it talks about Elijah coming back, right? Okay. So you want me to read five? Did you ever read four? Yep. <coughs> Excuse okay, me. So Malachi chapter four, verse five, bless you. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's Armageddon. And Elijah will be sent back. And I think that's interesting that we get from that message. That's telling us, I will send you Elijah. Now, I think it's an interesting thing. Uh, a lot of, in the Jewish culture, a lot of uh, the families, um, now I don't know this firsthand. I've just read this and watched videos about it. A lot of the Jewish families during Passover, Passover, they have a custom where they'll put a glass of wine mm. on, the front, uh, on the front step during Passover. They're expecting Elijah to come right. back. And if I can mention, Pastor Tim, uh, this is kind of, off my notes, but when Jesus said, Ale, Ale, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you, why have thou forsaken me? me. They thought, because they learned in the book of Malachi, that um, they thought when Elijah would show up, that what would happen? What did they think would would follow Elijah from Malachi? Do you remember? They thought the great, that'd be the day that he'd show up. I mean, right. That's the, that's the day of the ushering into the kingdom, right? Or the great, great day of judgment. Right. Yeah. So they had that in the last, you know, the last Testament or the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, there's 39 books, 39th book of the Old Testament. They they used a lot of their religion before coming into the New Testament. They thought that Elijah would usher in the great day. It'd be like. That's right. And I I will. uh, Well, go ahead with with your butt. Oh, I was just going to say that the whole Jesus thing. Yeah. It's it's known or it's widely adopted when when Jesus said, Ale, Ale, Lama Sabachthani, 
what a lot of the people thought he was doing was calling for Elijah because they didn't believe he was the son of God. They, they, they didn't realize what right. he was saying. He was quoting Psalms 22. Right. So go ahead. What were you going to say? Yeah. I mean, that, that shows the dangers of presupposition, right? So um, one of the one of the pillars of our shows, right, is that we want to get to the truth, which is why we're digging into all these scriptures the way we are, not uh, not um, interpret the Bible based on um, you know based on what what we've learned kind of in society, right? And and right. you know all of us have a history of you know of what we were taught when mm-hmm. we were younger, and the idea is that we want to go to scripture and learn the truth, and th- and that right there shows the the problem of presuppositions because all the all the Jewish people, except for those that eventually followed Christ, the Jewish people in, in Christ's day had a presupposition, right? That Christ, that when Christ, when the Messiah came, he would come as a conquering king. And so because of that presupposition, they didn't recognize him when he came as a suffering savior, uh, suffering servant. That's and right. so uh, and so that's a good lesson, I think, uh, all around. And I was going to say... Um, that um, on all of the theories on who these two people are, everybody agrees just about that Elijah is one of them, right? Because because of the one we just read, all of these things are are evidence that Elijah will be one of the two witnesses. There's others, right? Transfiguration and other things, which I think we'll get into. Um, but the fact that that um, the scriptures tell us that Elijah will be sent in uh, before the coming of the great day, the revel day of the Lord, that's evidence right there. Right, There's one of these, many, one of several we'll talk about. Right, and that that's very specific. Right, the other ones are are circumstantial but strong. Right, the fact that the, that the that the the two one of the that the two witnesses will provide will be able to do these miracles, and the fact that we know Elijah could do these miracles that's strong circumstantial evidence. When you combine that with the fact that the scriptures tell us in Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, that when the dreadful and the great dreadful day of the Lord comes, I will send you Elijah. Right, that's powerful evidence that Elijah is, in fact, one of the two witnesses. I think it is, and I, you know, that's that's really wonderfully put. I don't know. Does Isaiah, does Luke four and Isaiah sixty one? I don't know when Jesus goes to the uh, the synagogue to preach Isaiah sixty one, the grateful day of the Lord. Does that tie into this in, in any way, Pastor Tim? I know well, that's random, but yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it sure it sure does, right? Because it's all talking about this great and grateful day of the Lord, right? And that's. That's the time period that we're talking about, right? So um, I don't think it ties in necessarily to who the two witnesses, the two witnesses are, but, right. it, but it tells us about the, this time period that, gotcha. we're, that we're talking about. And, you know, as a side note, if we, if we could just for a second, right, um, I think this is a good point to, to add something that's not um, following the scriptures on these evidences. But as a side mm-hmm. note, why do we need two witnesses? Right? And... Uh, I think uh, uh, even today there's been studies that have shown that an eyewitness correctly identifies the perpetrator of a crime like 88% of the time, right? So when we look at arrest records and, and, and trial verdicts, that's what the studies show is that an eyewitness uh, isn't perfect, right? But an eyewitness uh, identifies the perpetrator of a crime 88% of the time. So if you combine two eyewitnesses that say the same thing, uh, you've got the truth. Right? Yeah, I think what's really cool, and I'm, I'm practicing not jumping ahead. I'm, doing, I'm on the fly. <laughs> that's, Witness, that's a good point, two witnesses yeah. in, our, in our life today. And I think really the, the, the part about Matthew will mention is another foundational uh, um, cool thing to think that God, where he took them, who was there, and what they talked about also bore witness and i'm not going to jump ahead pastor Tim. right uh, no absolutely the transfiguration right no that's good right so that's why there's two you know so so what's happening at this time frame right and why it's important for us to think about who the two witnesses are not essential for us to know who they are for salvation but why it's important for us to know is because when the great and terrible day of the lord comes um we will see these two witnesses and they'll be in jerusalem right this is something that we can that we can look for um, and of course, you know, we'll be raptured, right? Cause that happens prior to this, but, um, but there's something that we can see, right? So it's, it's, uh, you know, I think it's, um, it's good for us to, to be studying these things, right? Absolutely. So, um, and we've only mentioned a few things to help back up what, what our conclusion will be only a yeah. couple. Uh, so we haven't even got to, so yeah, let's keep going, right? So I think second Peter is, uh, is something that adds to this, right? We think about, um, the timing, 
right? So we will have more evidences of Elijah and, um, and of, of uh, Moses as the candidates for the two. Um, but there's this, there's this uh, idea of the timing too, right? I think that, yeah, I think uh, Pastor Tim's going to pull up 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. And I want to make a, a little small interlude to what Pastor Tim's referring to. Um, again, I can't, I can't dogmatically say this is what this means, but you read scripture, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Yep. And I think that's a fascinating uh, scripture passage. Uh, take it how you want to, but even even yeah. if you look at our if you look at our seven thousand year period or the six thousand years we've been through already, there's there's a thing called dispensational time periods uh, when there's a change of events. And so we have uh, Pastor Tim, we've we're basically at the six thousand year mark. We're about to enter the beginning of the seven thousand year mark that's right. in history. Then we're going to have the thousand year millennial reign. That's right. And so I think what's interesting, if I'm saying this right. Um, uh, for, actually, I think I'm going to mention, you go ahead and read first Hosea before I, right. before I mention what I'm about to mention. Yeah. Okay. So let me, and then I'll bring up, I think I'm gonna bring up your drawing too, cause I think you got okay. some art talent. So, uh, <laughs> this is what it says in Hosea six in verses one and two. Now, keep in mind what we just said, right? A day with the Lord is a thousand years. And it says, come and let us return unto the Lord for he hath torn. My glasses aren't working for he has torn and he will heal us. <laughs> He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. Now in Hosea 2, after two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Again, talking about these time frame, the time frame that we're talking about. Right? Second Peter is interesting how it could make you really think deeper in these time frames. It is. And so if we look at it, and I'm going to bring up your, uh, your notes, John. Right? That's so, really uh, archaic notes. That was for you, but go ahead. I know. I like it, though. I like your drawings. I could have done a lot better if I don't know it was going to be on the show, but, you know. That's hey. okay. I was surprised you liked that from time to time. So, yeah. so here's funny. your notes that you've got for the time frame, right? Why don't you talk us through this? Okay. I'm not sure because I'm delayed, so I don't know if I can look on her phone and see the note. Are you talking the diagram or the Yeah, the, with the, the days. Yep, the seven days. Okay. I'll just say it this way. So there's a few things where I think this is useful. You have this uh, – so we have this uh, – at the end of the millennial reign, when, when everything's done, right now we're at 6,000 years, but when all the millennial reign happens at the end of time as it is, that would be a 7,000-year complete period. Do you agree, Pastor Tim? Yes. Okay. So when God was making you know, creation, the beginning God created, and he, there, were, there were days. There were days of creation, six days, and then it says on the seventh day, and I didn't give you scriptures, but you know generally it's Genesis 1. Right. Um, I think um, I think Genesis chapter two verse one says he was done and all the host of them. I'm doing that by memory, and then it says on that day he rested. Well, if you look at, if you look this up, actually that means cease to labor, or cease to minister, do ministry in the earth. I think that's cool. Right. I didn't even mention that to you, but these yeah. these time periods, based on Second Peter chapter three verse eight, could very well be point to other spiritual truths, like the first thousand years could represent day one creation the mar uh, the marriage adam and eve day two in his creation and i forget all the things were made on all the days but then you get to day six man is made right yep and if you look at the six thousand year period if you use that analogy of second peter chapter three verse eight uh chapter three that would represent the day of the lord now i don't know how people want to look at that but dispensationally you could tie that to the first day is a thousand years and, and, and the dispensational time frames actually line up pretty accurately with the events that have happened. That's right. So day one, day two, day three. Now day seven, God rests. Now think about this. This is completely random. I didn't give you any warning. Well, the beginning of the seventh year period, or the seven, uh, the, the, when the 6,000 year period hits, on the 7,000 year period, what, is, what does God do for a thousand years or one day or That's the right. seventh day? Yeah. That's I probably normal. took that too deep. Do you get what I'm getting at? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it ties to his resting from his the ministry on earth. That's right. The church is lifted out. So the ministry. Yeah, there's no the ministry in the earth. That's right. On the seventh day. That's right. I think that's cool. That was random. But. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, wanted to throw, I wanted to show everybody your artwork. All right. Well, we're running out of time. So I, <laughs> we got to get back into it. Okay. So okay. We, saw the, we saw all the miracles, right? 
and and now um, now we get to Ma- that Matthew 17 that you were bringing up, right? So yes. if we take a look at Matthew 17, we'll we'll speed up everybody. I know it's been an hour already, uh, and we had um, oh, and I lost my interconnection. connection. Am I still broadcasting? Uh, you are, and there's a few more stuff to talk about still. If we can, yeah, try we to hurry it along. We can, but I, I won't be able to bring up the scriptures because I can't get to um, to my. Uh, there it is. Okay, so Matthew, I don't know what happened there. You gotta Matthew forgive 17. Okay, so so Matthew 17, um, and we're going to look at verses 4 and 5. It says, Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make three tabernacles. Right? Who are they making them for? One for Moses. thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And, uh, and then it says, um, While yet he spake, behold, a a bright cloud overshadowed them. Behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Mm -hmm. Right. And then it goes on to say, and when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, arise and be not afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus, Jesus only. And as they came to the mountain, Jesus charged them saying, tell this vision to no man. What was the vision, right? That he saw, Jesus, Jesus Moses, and Elijah, right? And Jesus glorified. Tell, uh, until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Wow. Wow, risen again, huh? And then his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must come, uh, must come first? And um, I didn't keep up with it on the screen. Apologize for that. That's okay. Quick point to that. To just I know we're trying to move this along fast. The yep. same people we heard about calling fire down from heaven to shut up the, the waters. Here you go again. These two guys, Moses and Elijah, Matthew 17, 4. Here they are again together, and they're watching Jesus glorified. It's almost like they're having a conversation. Now, is it likely, right? Oh, this is completely um, really just me, but it's almost like they were having a conversation saying, hey, what, look, these, these Jews, they weren't listening. I guess we need to maybe read. This is just me, but right. we need to. Maybe we're having a meeting, you know, God's there, Jesus, Moses, Elijah, they see Jesus glorified, and you have Peter, James, and John, so there's seven people there, if you count God, and, you know, I, I like to imagine, are they having a conversation by saying, look, this didn't work, we gotta, we gotta figure something out, I need you guys here in the tribulation a little while later, I need you to hang tight, now that's what I imagine they were talking about. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I like to imagine those conversations too, John. Yeah, but, um. Yeah. So, go ahead, Matthew 17. Yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, do we have more to read there? Um, 17, 11 through 13. Yeah, so let's, uh, let me bring that back up. Um, and so 11, and Jesus answered Sam, then Elijah truly shall come first, or first come, and restore all things. So did, re- so Elijah didn't restore all things when he was here the first time, right? And then Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind, so he didn't die. And then it says, that he shall come first to restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they liked. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Right? So what is he saying there? Right? Now we know Elijah was here, but he said he came already, right? Come, He came back already, right, is how we can interpret that. And then he says that the disciples understood that he was speaking to them and John the Baptist. But disregarded him. Yeah. And so I know we're trying to move along. So they could have been, like I said, they could have been accepted before the church age happened, but, uh, but they denied Jesus. So Elijah will have to show up again. Could be in the tribulation. That's right. So, so, so Elijah, yeah. So I think Elijah, right. It's clear uh, that Elijah, we, we can, we can do more right, of this, but I think it's clear that Elijah is one of the two witnesses. So let's, can we, you want to move to Enoch? Uh, so, uh, or is there more see. you want to say about Elijah? Uh, well, I can, I just really quick, I'm going to scan over. I won't read it all, but uh, Matthew 11, seven through 14, uh, it, uh, it says Jesus began to speak to the multitudes, talking about John the Baptist, what he would see. So if you guys read on your own, uh, Matthew 11, 7 through 14, it's just more stuff confirming he came as John the Baptist yeah. and they disregarded it. And then Luke chapter 1, it says the same thing, and he shall go before him in the spirit of the power of Elijah. And Luke chapter 1 talks about that same thing. It confirms it again, um, the spirit of Elijah. 
Um, and I'll just Romans eleven thirteen says he speaks to the gen- and it just confirms more of the same stuff. That was my notes on that. Right. But then if we go over to Mark chapter nine, um, verses eleven through thirteen, I'll read that really quick, Pastor okay. Tim, and I'm trying oh. to move forward here. Sure, right. I'll bring it up to get to our conclusion. Yep. Um, and it says, and they asked him, saying, "Why say the scribes and Elias must first come?" And he answered and told them, "Elias, verily come first." And restore all things and how it is written of the son of man that he must suffer many things and be set in naught. but i say unto you that elias is indeed come they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him and then you get to this next part i'm going to let you discuss um um did, did you have my notes on enoch what i wrote i mean yeah did you have anything to that. say about yeah so 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 again um what we're i think i think what we're what we're trying to 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 work through here let me bring my my camera back up. What we're trying to work through here is, you know, who who are the two witnesses, right? And Elijah's got some very strong evidence. Everybody typically agrees to scholars. The second one of the two, <clears throat> there's there's a lot of evidence that it's Moses, especially the Mount of Transfiguration. So we went through some of that, right? Uh, the fact that Moses could do those miracles and that he did that, turn the water to blood. But there right. is there is a, a possibility that one of the two witnesses is Enoch, and and there's really only one evidence because Enoch doesn't doesn't say a lot about Enoch in the in the in the Bible. There's there's one area that it talks about him, but um, and Jude, you're right. But it um, but Enoch was one that never died, right? So like it said, Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind. It says Enoch lived so many years and then he walked with God and walked with God and then he was not right? So if we look at Hebrews 9.27, it tells us that it is appointed for man to die once, right? And then the judgment. And so the two people in the Bible that never died are are Elijah and Enoch. So mm-hmm. some people say that makes sense that they come back and then they're killed as the two witnesses. So, they're, so everybody dies once. Um, you were alluding to the fact that uh, Moses died and was buried, but then there was all this controversy about that. And then his body was taken up to heaven. Yeah, Michael debated with Satan about, you know, well, yeah. for some reason, God's like, nope, I want his body lifted for a future purpose. And there was a debate about that. And a lot of people think, uh, really, there's very little evidence at all, uh, actually almost none to support. Enoch. I know there's a book written about That's Enoch. Right. Maybe we'll do a show about that. But really, Jude 4, if there's only one chapter of Jude. I think it references, it says Enoch is seven from Adam. He yep. was basically, and maybe this is another show, there's actually seven raptures not the rapture i'm not referring to that right there's somebody like catching away <clears throat> yeah not being one of the first ones that's all right exactly and here's the uh here's the verses right that, that talk about that so and enoch walked with god after he he begat methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters and all the days of enoch were 360 and five years that's Pro- awesome. yeah it's interesting right uh, and enoch walked with god and he was not for god took him and that sounds an awful lot like what we would picture the rapture to be. Mm-hmm. So really, that's all we have. And there's all kinds of speculation. We're definitely not going there because we're running out of time about Enoch. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not even going to go there. It, there's nothing to me. It's, now we, uh, did we read the rest of Revelation? Do we pick apart we the did. last little section of Revelation uh, 3 through 12? And kind of revisit the original scriptures. Yeah, let's we do that. And then before and then, we conclude. Yeah, let's do that. You want to read it? Yeah, I think uh, the bottom was. I'll start. I don't. I just have all the verses together. I know it starts with and when they shall have finished their testimony. I don't okay. know what verse that is. Let's see. Because I have okay, that's verse there. seven. Yep. Okay. Well, verse seven of, of Revelation eleven, chapter. Uh, excuse me, chapter eleven, verse seven. It says, "This is the original story of the two witnesses." And when they have finished their testimony, these two witnesses that are that are put on earth here, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, which we heard about earlier in the Bible, shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So these two witnesses, if you say you're one of the two witnesses, not a good idea because you die. All right. Um, it'll make war with them and it kills them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called sodom and egypt and and even now in jerusalem there's a lot of uh i don't know if this is taboo to say this even now there's a lot of um sodom gomorrah type of stuff going on right now currently and i'm not going to go there pastor tim right so there's this where it's referencing it's sodom and uh, sodom and egypt is a spiritual reference 
where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and the kindreds of tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall uh, not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. What does that mean, Pastor Tim? What do you get from that? Yeah, so they're going to lie there, right, um, with the people celebrating around them for their, for their death. And then um, they're not going to be buried, right? They're not going to have, you know, they're not going to be, uh, they're not going to, before they're resurrected, right, they're not going to, they're not going to be, you know, cared for in the manner of right. those who, those who are dead. And it's up for the de- depiction of who we talked about this in one of our other messages about who, who the people are that are dying and who the ones that are survived during the okay. tribulation, but that we did that already. Um, it says after that, and they stood under the feet and a great fear fell upon them, which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up to the heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld. They watched. And so we discussed, um, I think we're at the end here, but we basically discussed uh, Matthew, uh, Luke 1. Let me move on really quick. Um, John the Baptist. Enoch is a type of church, church aid saying he was raptured, I believe. Genesis yep. 5, 22 through 24. I think you read that already, right? That's right. Uh, 365 years. Um, he was, a. let's see, Second Kings chapter 2, so, uh, verse 11. says, and it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up that's, by a whirlwind into heaven. Did you read that already? Yeah, that's where we talked about the fire, right? Uh, how he's tied okay. to the fire. Okay. Um, yep. What was my last point here? So so we can tie Moses and, and Elijah, right? Moses to um, in Numbers, right? Numbers chapter 16, we can tie... Mm-hmm. Um, Moses and Elijah together. Yeah, and they're connected. If the Second Kings chapter one, nine, and ten, Second Kings one, eleven through thirteen, tie Elijah with fire, and then Numbers sixteen twenty eight through twenty nine, and Numbers sixteen thirty five, ties them together with. So Moses and Elijah and those scriptures are tied together by fire and by water, and Revelation yeah. eleven says that there'll be two witnesses. Right. Tied together by fire and water. So, look, I mean, sure, it could be somebody else, Pastor Tim, but God yep. sure put a whole lot of information directly pointing to who these people are. Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, hopefully my interruptions on you, John, didn't didn't uh, throw us off. So hopefully we, you know, we made the point that we were trying to make. And, and I, and I you know, I'm probably not as dogmatic on this as you are. Um, I, if somebody had to pin me down, I would say it's Moses and Elijah. Um, but... Uh, I do think about that fact that Enoch didn't die, right? And um, but then again, when we talk about the the rapture, um, Paul says in Thessalonians, right, that that uh, that those that are alive when he comes will be taken up with him in heaven, right? So there's going to be a whole group of people that get taken up just like Enoch did, that don't die, right? So I, yeah, go ahead. I assume I'm going to say this. I you know I, I I love discussing things with you. I don't even know that I'm dogmatic that it's them, but I'll just say. It sure points to them. It sure does point to them. And I want to make this one statement before I'm done. And this is just me making a statement about this whole thing we just read. Picture this. you got a whole nation who's disregarding uh, the coming of Jesus, completely disregarding it. Right. You have the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, New Testament. You have the prophecy, Elijah, the prophet. You're going to love this. Moses, the law, the Ten Commandments. The Old Testament's the law. The New Testament's grace, right? So you have the law and the prophecy. You have a country that's rejecting God no matter what they see. And so you got to hear this. This is this is my ending statement. This is my imagination, right? So you have this whole nation rejecting everything. But the two people that these people that rejected God, the two people that if they were going to witness during a tribulational period, they all believed in Elijah was coming. And true. they all believed in the law because they tried to follow, look, ask the Pharisees and Sadducees. They tried to follow it. So if there was going to be a mass revival and you were God and you wanted, and we talked about who we think the 144,000 were, we both, right. I think scripture points fairly to those children of Jesus's generation, 12,000 Jews, 12 tribes. Now I don't know that dogmatically, but if I were God, which I'm not, <laughs> if I wanted to speak to the people, wouldn't I want my law and my prophecy? Yeah. I mean, that's another good evidence for it. That's right. Yeah. They didn't die. I mean, one died, but he brought him back. 
Those if would I were be God. Yeah, those would be good witnesses. They'd be the perfect witnesses, and who better to follow them than That's somebody right. that didn't have guile in their mouth from the last episode who was pure. If I were gonna, if I were gonna create a mass, a mass ministry to revive the the, the Jews that have fallen, that I want to graft back into my church or into yeah. my my tree, I'd use my law and I'd use my prophecy. That's the entire word of God, by the way. That's the Old and New Testament. That's right. That's the word. And he left the other comforter with him on earth to bring this mass revival out. If I were God, which I'm not, I'd, I'd use Moses and Elijah anyway. Yeah. But I don't disagree. <laughs> so, makes sense. Yeah. So, good conversation. Enjoyed yes. it. I enjoyed it, John. Hopefully those uh, that are out there viewing enjoyed it as well. And, uh, you know, this is, this is not for the, uh, this is not for the, you know, the, uh, the new uh, believer probably, right? This is for probably those not. that want to <laughs> dig into the, the scripture. And, uh, and, and uh, I know I enjoy doing that with you. Um, I think you've got a lot of knowledge. And, and, uh, and so I love talking about this stuff with you, Pastor John. And so hopefully people like hearing the discussion. And um, I appreciate everybody that took the time to listen. Uh, and until next time, uh, remember that. A- yeah, go ahead. And hey, for the people that aren't digging in deep, uh, we have another show. Pastor, you can tell right. what that is. Yeah, so uh, I'm actually going to, um, it's on the bottom of our screen, right? So uh, yeah. it's a uh, word for the week. This is the word for the week, thought for the day. And we have a show called Word for the Week that uh, airs on Saturdays at 1.30 Central, 2.30 Eastern on, on Preach the Word Network TV. It's ptwwntv.com and click on the Atlanta market. And uh, that show, I think, is a really good show. And the, the word for this week um, is love. That's the one that's airing this Saturday. And then uh, next Saturday, the word for the week will be faith, which is a great one. Yes, that's really good. So, yep. All right. So until next time, remember that uh, we love you. And God loves you. We'll, we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.